Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, presuming no more Grand Prix are added to the calendar, uh, we're now about halfway through the season. Would you believe it? And after a dominant display at the Saxon Ring, reigning champion Fabio Quattararo has extended his lead in the championship standings over Alessia Spargro. And Joanne Zarco, with another beautiful ride, slots himself now into third in the standings. A costly mistake, however, and another non-score once again for Ducati's Francesco. Francesco Bagnaia, Honda and Suzuki suffering miserable weekends too. And we'll have all the Moto2 and Moto3 action as well. The recording date is Monday the 20th of June. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash's MotoGP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewitt. Now, before we get stuck into all the weekend's action, Keith, I know uh, Steve Harris passed away uh, recently and, and he was somebody that had a, a great deal of involvement uh, with you and you're very close to him and, and lots of sort of UK riders who certainly knew how to race bikes yeah i mean obviously uk you know owe a great debt to steve harris steve harris harris performance products lester harris his brother steve bayford their business partner they set up in hartford <clears throat> a long long time ago you know redesigned chassis for barry sheen steve parish myself various other people in in here and internationally as well i mean they, they were an international firm lots of people came to them for sorting out chassis back in the day when you had to maybe honda could use their uh, help and expertise as things are in MotoGP gp nowadays but steve harris great guy great guy very funny really talented as was his brother lester as was steve bayford but um sadly he'd had a long illness um parkinson's and so on and all the complications that go with that and steve passed last last week much to the sadness to anybody of, of a certain age that's for sure and and the real sad it's it's called sod's law isn't it i mean he He'd done a deal with uh, the Indian version of Royal Enfield. They'd sold Harris Performance basically to Royal Enfield. So just when you're about to take all your money out of the business, having slogged your guts out for so many years working for the likes of us, um, he goes and cops a, a Parkinson's and um, isn't able to enjoy it, which is a great shame in those circumstances. But condolences to the rest of the family and anybody else that was close to Steve Harris because he was a great guy, very funny and a pleasure to work with. Absolutely well said. And I think everyone at Crash.net echoes those sentiments as well. Uh, but it was, of course, a busy weekend racing, wasn't it, once again? And we're going straight into uh, another weekend. But before we look at that, let's look back. Uh, and it was, of course, at the Saxon Ring and Bagnaia uh, on pole position. Uh, but a good start, Keith, wasn't quite enough to hold back Fabio, who it seems now is beginning to get a little bit of a stronghold on this championship after the first few races where we really didn't know which way it was going. It now seems Quattararo on that Yamaha is working wonders. I think you've summed it up there, working wonders. He's, you know, from the start line where you would expect it's uphill, you would have expected the Ducati to have out dragged him to turn one. It would have been Bagnaia's strategy to try and hold back Quattararo. He, he got a medium tyre on the rear, which will have given him early grip as well. So it was a situation where, you know, they, what they were expecting from Quattararo was to try and make a break. What Bagnaia's job was, sorry, Quattararo trying to make a break. Bagnaia's job was to try and thwart that in the first few corners if he could. He couldn't. Quattararo managed to make that break, got underneath Bagnaia at turn one, and that was it. Strange situation for Bagnaia, really strange. You know, track temperature was 52 degrees. It all gets a bit oily when it gets sort of north of 50 degrees. You know, some tracks are different, but uh, it's one of those situations where... Everything that's in the tarmac seems to float to the surface and you just get a really weird feeling about it. And with with that track being, you know, you spend 30 seconds on the left-hand side of the tyre. 30 seconds. That might not sound like a lot, but it really is. For It's torturous for a tyre. Once you've done that sort of the Omega, the, the, the turn three, that, that right-hander that loops back around the Omega shape of an Omega, strangely enough, um, and then it's all left-handers all the way to the waterfall where you drop down a Ralph Oldman corner, the, the turn 11, the right-hander. It's amazing what the tyre goes through. But, of course, that wasn't even where it tripped Bagnaia up. I mean, turn one, it just looked like the rear end slithered out front. As soon as he tapped the throttle, as soon as he tapped the throttle, once commentators had shut up, something we don't all do, <laughs> you could just hear he just tapped the throttle in and round it came. Nothing he could do about it. So frustrating for him, but surely that's it for him. You know, like you said in the intro, we are 10 more Grand Prix. We've done 10. He's, how far will behind is he? Let me have a quick look. 91 points. I wrote it down earlier. Huge amount. 91 points behind. 25 for a win. You know, he's just got to keep banging the wins in and hoping that Quattararo doesn't finish. 
something that don't look likely. I know Pete's going to pick up on this. The guy's momentum at the moment is everything. He just gets every single point there is available to him and he makes the best of it. I have to say, I think Saxon Ring was probably the best ride that Quattararo's ever had. Really difficult track. Not a favourite at all. Not the easiest build up to it or anything like that. And he looked just imperious all the way through it, right from the lights out. Brilliant. Yeah, you just can't hand Quattro that kind of present, can you, with the form that he's on at the moment. And uh, whatever happens this weekend in Aston, he's going into the summer break leading the championship, isn't he, now that, you know, he, he doesn't even have to start the race. And he'll, you know, even if a leash wins, he'd have a nine point lead. So, yeah, a big, big uh, blow for any of his rivals, really. And, and where does this lead Ducati, as you say, Keith? I mean, they're, OK, Zarco's third in the World Championship, but what, what is it, Six, over 60 points behind? I mean, Bastianini fourth, 70 points behind. And yet, at the same time, that they're kind of dominating the constructors. It's 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 that 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 situation where all of those bikes it pays off in some ways, but Yamaha having all of their eggs in the Quattro basket, it's working for them now. You know, who'd have thought after that that tricky start to the year that they both had, Quattro didn't get that dry podium until Portimao, the win there, round five, and then since then he's just been faultless, hasn't he? And he's kept it going. And Bagnaia has kept getting pulled down. It's just when he looks like he's getting somewhere, he gets a win, he gets a result, and then something happens. What is it? He's only he's only scored points in about half of the ten races. I mean, okay, he got taken out by Nakagami, but this was his his third accident. Then he had that bad race in in Mandalika, the single point in the wet. I mean, who would have thought it? I mean, after the end of last year and the, the, you know coming into this season that, that he'd be in this position. And as you say, Keith, he was absolutely mystified, wasn't he, after the race as to what he'd done wrong? Which again must be must be playing on his mind as well. You know, going into Assen, he'll he'll certainly. Uh, want to have a you know a solid Friday practice Assen being you have to say one of the difficult tracks for Ducati last year as well so yeah let's see but I mean it's it's hard to see how Quattro can be stopped now it's certainly I think it's it's going to fall into the the realms of bad luck and those sort of things and I mean you know you, you can't rely on that at this level more importantly than the uh, Riders' Championship, of course, to the manufacturers, is the Manufacturers' Trophy. And it's at the moment, it looks like Quattararo could single-handedly win the Manufacturers' uh, title for Yamaha when Ducati had got, a, what, nearly a third of the bikes on the grid. Honda were a miserable failure again this weekend. I mean, Bradle was the only one to finish on a Honda out of the points on a factory Honda. And the other three, you know, two retirements, it just, it's, it's nuts at the moment. You know, Quattararo, he's riding brilliantly and everyone else is just failing all around him. There's a lot of people scratching it, their heads. It's shocking, fact, isn't he... it? Especially when... <laughs> Sorry, Keith. Sorry, mate. No, well, just echoing right. what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's incredibly shocking, isn't it? The the, the form uh, that Honda are in versus someone like Fabio Quattararo, who, as you say, can be a team in his own right, the rate he's currently going on. And we'll come on to Honda uh, in a moment. I just want to touch on uh, our podium as well, because Joanne Zarco, you mentioned Ducati. He ended up being the best Ducati in the end for Pramac. Uh, getting onto the podium, he's had a great run of form at the moment, hasn't he, Keith? Uh, and has now wound himself up into third in the title. Who would have thought that out of all the Ducati riders this year, leading the way in the standings would be Zarco and Bastian as the top Ducati riders. Well, Bastianini's been unlucky, really. He's fallen away with the, with the, the lack of his crew chief who's got COVID, so he wasn't out there at the time. And I think that, that just goes to show you that how important that partnership is at each and every round. So you, you've got a situation there where Bastianini has just slipped a bit. But Zarco, I mean, you're right. Who would have said it? I mean, at the end of the day, Zarco is one of these guys that kind of blows a little bit hot and cold. You never really feel like you're going to put your money on him, although I think one of us does regularly. I think that bloke might be Harry. <laughs> but the point being, that how far away are we from, from him doing a, a good old French flip again? Because he's looking like a, he could be a Grand Prix winner at any minute. Will it be Assen? I mean, he goes all right at Assen. He goes, he goes good everywhere, Zarco. You can't write him off. But all of a sudden, there's you know the the hierarchy at Ducati must be thinking, hang on a second, he's the guy that we had the the bottom of the signings list, <laughs> and yet he's doing the business just about everywhere at the moment. And if he carries on the way he's going, with everybody now deciding to sign things a little later, which brings some common sense into the rider market, if you ask me, um, it's looking pretty good for Zarco at the minute. And he's got a bit of a trump card. And the French. And the <laughs> French, general, yes. actually. <laughs> One, two, yeah. Uh, you know, Zarco is, is running this front ride height system, isn't he? He's, he's stuck with that. He's the guy that Gigi seems to have chosen to develop that. And, you know, who knows? If they get that working, he does say 
it's more complicated, obviously, to, to set up and it changes changes things, but it helps with acceleration. If you know, potentially, there's something there that that if they get that dialed in, it's going to be gone at the end of the year. But you know, maybe that that could help him a bit. And then, as you say, Keith, uh, we heard on the weekend that uh, you know Zarka will be saying at Pramac, um, the factory team seat is between Bastianini and Martin. So Joan Mir will not be going there. So if Joan Mir is going to remain as a factory MotoGP rider, as we imagine, it will be at Repsol Honda because that's the only other place that's free. Mm. Well, uh, that does seem like the battle is uh, well and truly on for that Ducati factory seat, isn't it? Um, but one man who's certainly not going uh, to that factory seat, in fact, as we know, he signed with KTM. Uh, it was Jack Miller back on the podium once again in a great little scrap, actually, in the end for that final podium position between not only Miller, but of course, the two Aprilias, Alacious Bargro, Maverick Vinales back in it. Unfortunately, Keith, for Vinales in what is his best race ever on that Aprilia. I think last year at Saxon Ring, he was plumb last, wasn't he, in, in the Yamaha. This year, running up in the podium spots, then at that rear ride height, ruining his race and having to retire. And Aleish also saying he was struggling with some uh, technical issues as well. Well, the technical issue I think Aleish had was the fact that Miller was just pushing up the inside every single time at Turn 1 until he forced him into a mistake. But getting back to the ride height thing, um, yeah, one of them runs the automatic ride height, one of them runs a manual. And as far as I understand it anyway. And I think Maverick Vinales runs the the sort of more automated system, whereas I think Aleish runs the um, do-it-yourself affair on the two Aprilias. And uh, the, the ride height adjuster that um, Vinales was running brilliantly just collapsed at the back, never released. Um, and you can't ride a bike that's um, set up like a chopper. It just doesn't work that way. Um, very sad for, for Vinales, but you could see how pleased he was. He wanted to slap the hands and, and give the high fives when he came into pit lane because he was so chuffed with the way things were going. The mechanics looked absolutely dumbstruck. They were really upset and they didn't really want to do the old fist pump to the high five because <laughs> no. their bike had just pulled in. It but was a bit awkward Maverick to watch. So, yeah, Maverick was so happy with it. He, he would have kissed you if you'd been there, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it was certainly... Uh, it, uh, of reading his comments, Pete, after the race, it, you know, he wouldn't have thought he'd retired. He was so, he, you know, he was like, I don't really care the fact that I haven't finished this race. It's the fact I've been up there. Third was there for the taking, really. And his teammate, Aleish, obviously trying to make up for uh, the disaster and, and a once in a career mistake uh, from last time around at the Catalan Grand Prix, finishing one lap too soon. But he was saying as well afterwards that he had some sort of vibration issues, I think, on, on this front Yeah, something side. we heard about throughout the weekend, really. You mentioned Jack Miller earlier. He, of course, had the long lap penalty because he fell under a yellow flag on the Saturday. And he, and he put that down to a, a vibration at the front of the bike. It's sort of, you know, he said it wasn't going quick, but, you know, if you fall under a yellow flag, it's just not the done thing because there's marshals around, things like that. So, yeah, but but that's what Aleish said. Aleish changed the tyre on the grid. So he went to the grid with a, with a used front tyre, changed to a new one, which some of the other teams do for various reasons. Sometimes they heat the whole wheel and things like that. Um, and as soon as he pulled away, he, he said at, at turn one, he felt this vibration and, and he, he just didn't have the pace after that. So that was his issue. And yeah, and then Vinales, unfortunately, I mean, as you say, best race by far for, on the Aprilia, I mean, and, and had podium pace. I mean, he looked like he was sizing up Aleish for a pass, didn't he? And, uh, and then, yeah, luckily, uh, you know, he had a few scary moments with that ride height device. He said, you know, at first he thought, well, is it a puncture? Is it something like that? And then, and then he pretty quickly realized what it was. He tried jamming the brakes on, which is the way that it should disengage. Um, he tried everything to, to, to make it release, but it just wouldn't. I think, I think he even tried pressing it again and it just went down further. So uh, yeah, he had no choice in the end. You can't sort of, sort of finish the race like that with it, with it so low. Not the only one we should say, Alex Marquez, same thing, ride height uh, device broke. So he was another guy. Was it the temperatures somehow cooking the, you know, these, these aren't electronic systems. They can't be, was it, cooking the hydraulics somehow who knows but yeah very unusual to have two two failures of a, of a right height system in one race but uh yeah that's uh it gets it gets incredibly hot i'm glad you touched on the heat situation there pete because it does get incredibly hot. i don't know what it is about a land mass like that saxony is in the middle of the massive piece of europe and it it, it does get incredibly hot there the, the you can feel it off the you know it's not just the sun beating down it's coming off the tarmac and, you know, whenever I've been in Saxony, I've always thought, bloody hell, where does all this heat come from? Your, your hire car, you just expect to get back to your hire car and the seats are like melted into the, the chassis of the car. You know, you, you, you wonder how modern day equipment actually is so resilient against that kind of temperature. You know, stick your, stick your ECU and all your other bits in the oven and turn it up to gas mark six. 
you know, because it's literally that. I mean, riders are burning the aero that's that nowadays on on the the way the aero works on a lot of these bikes. The air, some of it is is focused on you. You you cop a fair bit of the heat that's rising up through the through the motorbike itself, and uh, you can get burnt by virtue of the fact that that heat is affecting you so badly. It's incredible. Well, well, you say you say that, and and that was <clears throat> excuse me. That's precisely what uh, what the Honda riders were feeling, wasn't it? And particularly the only one that finished, test rider Stefan Br- uh, Bradle. Uh, and and you think actually he he never rarely criticizes, if ever, the team. But he came out with some uh, well heated comments as a result because the fact he was the the only rider to finish uh, on the Honda, sixteenth, fifty two seconds off, no points. Aspargo, Nakagami, Marquez, all gone. It, what a nightmare for Honda! Like you, you, it has to be uh, bigger than just finding tweaks here and there. Surely it, there ha- there's must be some. There's got to be a huge reset somewhere along the line for them. Well, Surely they can't go on like that. There'll definitely be a reset, but it won't be this year. It'll be later on in the year. I mean, they might be able to make a few tweaks here and there, but they are where they are. They, they've got what they've got, and that unfortunately they don't have any concessions. <laughs> Mind you, if they carry on going the way they are, they will be getting concessions. They might get them. Can you imagine the uh, mighty Honda back in the concession department? Um, might be good for um, making developments for next year, but I don't think that anybody at Honda will be um, looking for that. I, Honda are, are in so much trouble, aren't they? I mean, it's just you know one bit of bad luck on top of another, really. Um, and Bradle's a test rider and a commentator. You know, he, he he does brilliantly. He's a great rider and he's a great guy. You know, and and he is struggling with that Honda, and he knows it probably better than anybody else. I think that you know Saxon Ring is is a is a is another one of those unique racetracks. It's a bit of a blast back into the past, really. It's it's not the safest racetrack anymore. It's it's short and sharp, and it's a difficult place to be at when you've got problems. You know, everything's on a different level. Getting into the track's difficult. There's you know there was allegedly two hundred and odd thousand people there over the weekend. People can fill us up on that in a moment. But you know, when you come in, you've got to come in with the fans because you can't get to the paddock. You've got to go through tunnels. Hospitality units where you keep all your, you know, obviously where your respite is, is a little bit away from where the actual trucks are, where you're working. So you've got, you know, everything is extended. Everything is hard work. Even from a broadcasting point of view, it's right down the last, between 12 and 13, the last two corners. You're right at the very bottom of the racetrack. So on a massive hillside. I used to love it because you could, you know, it was like a fitness test. It was like, you know, you're going out climbing a mountain and you did that five six seven eight times a day backwards and forwards up and down from the very bottom of the track i think everybody's completely knackered when they come away from there they're going to be um mind you they're going to be much better off at Assen because that's another hard work track <laughs> interesting stuff yeah, and they they visibly looked knackered on the podium actually i think miller was had a, had a bit of a sit down didn't he just looked out of breath although he had just run to the stands hadn't he and, and to give some gloves to uh to a fan which was <laughs> like Quattararo did. as well wasn't it and Quattro did the same day. That was absolutely fantastic. That needs to happen more often. But I, I mean, yeah, Pete, it's, if if Bradle's making those comments as well, and and when was you might not know this? I don't know. When was the last time no Honda scored points in a MotoGP uh, race? I think I saw something. It was, it's decades ago or something. I, I mean, yeah, it, it's. But yeah, I mean, the, the thing. Aleish also, it's, it, some people might know it's Aleish didn't race with the new Aprilia fairing. He was also having issues with the heat. So the, the, these, these heat problems were happening to okay. other, other guys as well. But uh, yeah, with Bradle, as you say, I think it was his hand and his foot. And then you had Pole, it was his foot. But, but he was also already battered in the ribs from his big accident on the Friday. So he didn't finish. So, so yeah, I mean, Alex Marquez was the only one who went away physically well, but with a bike that was, that was obviously broken. So yeah, I mean, a disastrous race for for Honda, as you say, under those circumstances. And, and yeah, the heat, I mean, we saw even uh, power cuts, didn't we? I think on, on the Saturday, just from the, the heat in the region, it was it was absolutely roasting. So yeah, a punishing weekend. And Zarco looked uh, pretty worn out. He'd given his all, hadn't he, by the end of the race as well. So they were all pretty happy to finish that one. But um, yeah, test, testing times. As far as the, the, the fan numbers, as, as Keith raised there, the only bit of uncertainty is that it seems like the tickets from 2020 and 21 were still valid. So people that, that weren't able to go to those events were able to come in. Exactly how many that is, we don't know. But either way, you know, over 200,000 fans, 95,000 on Sunday, that's a, that's a great crowd. And I think we can expect to see another well, a sold out 110,000, I think is the capacity for Assen this weekend. It wouldn't surprise me. Great event though. Another and, good one. 
I think we need to give a big shout out for Luca Marini as well. Best of the year so far, fifth place. He's been there before, obviously, but not this year. I think Luca Marini looked very strong at the end of the race. So obviously the heat and, and his training um, was pretty good and suited him. Now, talking of heat again, it all got a bit heated in the Tech 3 camp a bit earlier on in the weekend as well, didn't it? Between the two uh, teammates in there. I think yeah, halfway through the season, we got a, it's a bit of a long haul at the moment. There's a lot of hard work going on, back-to-backs and the like that we've got in the middle. And I think everybody's feeling it at the moment. Tech 3, obviously, you know, not really performing on the KTM. KTM not really performing. I mean, I, I took a bit of a, a long shot at um, Brad Binder for, for being a podium this year, just purely and simply because normally when it's slippery and hot like that, you know, and they make the KTM work, but still not really the kind of performance I think that they were looking for. So it's getting a bit hot under the collar in the KTM camp as well, by the sound of it. Well, you say it was Luca Marini's best result for sure. It was also Ralph Fernandez's best result, uh, 12th uh, that he achieved. So and 15th for Gardner. So that was uh, double points for them. But I think making hay of, of well a lot of retirements in the end. But as you say, very heated. And I think it was Remy Gardner, wasn't it, earlier on in the week, saying, "Well, I can't, I can't buy a Ducati," you know. And and to come out with a comment like that, I think is quite, you know indicative of the tough times that are going on down there in tech three although i don't really know what they expected because you saw how they performed last year and it, it was a tough slog yeah i don't think i can add to that harry i think it's when when it's like it is at the moment it's very very hard work obviously if if ktm had a motorbike that was working a little bit better then you'd see brad binder al doing a little bit more on it um more regularly i mean brad binder is he didn't become a bad rider overnight um, so I think KTM have just lost that momentum, that forward momentum, or everyone else has just made a little tiny step, and it only needs a little tiny step nowadays with how close it is across all of the the different mm. manufacturers. Um, so yeah, it seems that I, I don't know how much um, Quattararo actually weighs physically. I could look it up, of course I could, but he is worth more than gold um, because Yamaha are on a on a motorbike that really hasn't developed that much, I mean, minutely perhaps, and he is pulling off fantastic things, whereas everyone around him, you know, like I said earlier, Ducati with nearly a third of the bikes on the grid can't quite get there. Honda are, are really all at sea. Aprilia are obviously making steps, and it's going to be interesting to see whether they can make another one um, as this year moves on. Aleish is, is now a proper, you know, possible Grand Prix winner as we move into the second half, more Grand Prix wins as we move into the second half of the year. Um, Maverick Vinales has just fired an almighty shot across the bowels of everyone. And if Maverick Vinales becomes a believer and gets back to the kind of performance that we know he's capable of, huh, Assen will be a, just a perfect place to showcase that. I think, it's uh, exciting. just coming back briefly, the Binder and, and the KTMs, that qualifying is still hurting them badly, isn't it? it I mean, uh, perfectly understandable your punt on Binder for the race, Keith. I mean, again, another ride through the field, but they just... As he says, they can't get the soft tyres to work. They're missing that five, six percent. He said, and and when you start that far back, when things are this close, it's it's really hard to make up that ground. And then, as you say, Harry, about the tension in the, in the Tech Two team. Of course, it looks like you know Paul Spargo is pretty highly rumoured to be going back there. So that means that one of those guys is going to leave. I mean, so so there's definitely pressure on there. Um, Fernandez, as you say, his best race, and he seemed like he found something in the warm up that that uh, you know really worked for him, but. It's going to be interesting to see will that carry over to Assen now? Can he can he build some momentum or is this? We saw quite a few riders actually that that sort of stepped up. We saw Miller find something after a few bad races. Juan Mia found something. He was hurt by the swapping to the away from the medium to the hard rear tire, which he sort of regretted, and then he he had that accident. But th those guys also found something coming into this race. So there was a, there was a few guys that had reason to be optimistic. Let's say that they turned a bit of a corner after some tough rounds. But we'll, we'll need to see if it actually carries on into Assen. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, Fernandez finished in front of Morbidelli, 29 seconds off the pace, Franco Morbidelli at the end of that, uh, compared to his teammate who won it. I mean, we've spoken about it before. There's no point in, in drumming that again. But, you know, when you look at those results, then and then somebody like Luca Marini, who we just touched on in the last four races, ninth, sixth, sixth, fifth, incredibly strong results from him as well. So there, it's a tight feel, but there's a lot of young talent coming through. Uh, so I think we're going to get a few uh, change ups, uh, certainly. Well, we'll come back to MotoGP in a minute. Let's uh, go down to Moto2 and Moto3, shall we? Um, and in Moto2, Augusto Fernandez uh, was in, well, a bit of a class of his own, really, as he dominated uh, the Moto2. Moto2 ahead of Pedro Costa and Sam Lowe's and Keith it all got, it got very close at the end didn't it brilliant battle uh, for the podium with Lowe's uh, Marcel Schrotter for Minaldeguer uh, brilliant battle right to the flag 
Yeah, good to see Lowe's back on that kind of form. I've got to say that, you know, since round one, it really has been a hard slog for him. And, and you know, people accuse him of crashing. He does crash a lot. There's no doubt about that. He knows that as well as everybody else. But the fact is he's been taken out a fair few times as well. I think at least three of the crashes that uh, he's had, he's, other people have been involved in and, uh, and caused. Um, so I think Sam Lowe's back on that kind of form is always good to see. Uh, Vietti, of course, you know, it's all closed up at the top now. Vietti not scoring. That's a, a massive situation for as we move on into the second half of the year. So good to see Sam Lowe's back on the podium. And just, do you know what? He's one of those guys where you just hope he manages to keep that momentum going. You know, when you're riding at the kind of pace, the edge that you're riding on is so fine to override the, by the slightest amount, to push it by a millimetre or two more. We can't, when we're watching it on TV, you can't see what they can feel. You know, those bikes are on the move all of the time. Every single time they tip in, there's no room for the slightest error. And, and if you're riding a bit tight or just pushing your luck just a tiny bit, you saw, you know, we talked about MoGP and Bang Aya, it frustration. Why did it slide out from underneath him? He probably did nothing, virtually nothing different. There may have been some, he might have been, you know, a couple of inches further wide than he was the lap before or something. And that's what makes a difference. These guys are right on a knife edge all of the time. And Sam Lowe's, I always feel, is the kind of guy that he just tries to pinch that inch every single, if he's a little bit off the pace or if he's a little bit behind, whatever it might be, Sam always is a real trier. And for that, he's to be congratulated. So to see him on the podium, to see it work out for him on a, on a really difficult track like... Uh, where we've just been, Saxon Ring, <laughs> then uh, it's kind of one of those, I hope he can keep it going. And to go to Assen, I don't know what it is about Assen, but it always brings out the best in the Brits. I think we've got, we have a, usually a massive influx of, of fans that come over from the UK to, to go and watch it anyway. Hopefully that will be the case again. I mean, I've done that boat trip as a, as a broadcaster. Go across, you know, go down to the, the docks and get on your bike and get amongst them all and then ride up to the track. It's it's something a little bit special. Everybody really enjoys that trip. And it, it has a massive British feel to it as well. Well, they even have a, a BSB round there, don't they? British Superbike round at Assen as well. So we're kind of used to being across over over that side of um, the channel. It was interesting, wasn't it? All three races, there were, there were big runaway winners. And, uh, you know, some of the guys were asked about this and, and they said, well, look, Saxon Ring is the kind of track, just as Keith's been saying, really, where the rider can make the difference because you've got no real straights. So you can't just rely on the performance of the bike. You've got to make it work around the corners. And when you've got guys that like Fernandez and well, all the guys on the podiums re podium, really, but guys that are leading as well, we know the advantage you get from not being in, especially MotoGP, the dirty air, the turbulence, the, you know, the front tire temperature as well. It sort of builds on each on itself. But, uh, you know, fan, what, what was it? 7.8 seconds or something victory for Fernandez? Fantastic. I mean, a bit of a dark horse for the championship, you've got to say, if he can keep this up. But it's the kind of, kind of race that you get or the kind of result you get at this kind of track where a rider really just find something and can raise his level. He can wrestle the bike round. We saw Mark Marquez do it for so many years, didn't we? So, you know, I think all of these guys in all three classes that performed well at this weekend, they, they could be, you know, they could be in for, for a strong rest of the season if they can carry it on. Because Fernandez really kind of overshadowed, overshadowed by Acosta, wasn't he, coming in? He was the, the big rookie star and everything else. But really, Fernandez is the guy with the experience. And uh, if he can now build this momentum, as Keith says, Vietti stumbled again, uh, Agura did a decent job of recovering some points, but still, I mean, uh, it's getting close. So, yeah, we could have quite a fight on our hands in Moto2. You touched on tyre temperatures, Pete. I think we'd better, better emphasise that a little bit more because that is a major issue. You know, if you're in a, a big pack fighting for it, your front tyre pressure goes up. The, the, you know, when the tyre pressure goes up, the tyre the, the balloons. In other words, it doesn't deform in the, in the positive manner that you want it to deform, particularly braking, trail braking into a corner where you're, when you're coming into a corner, you're, you're hard on the brakes in a straight line and trail braking, as you tip in, you start to just come off the brakes just to release the brakes slightly. Trail braking, you trail it all the way into the apex of the corner or as close to it as you feel you can. And if you've got a tyre that's ballooned, it's it's got hot because you're running mid-pack, all the heat of those bikes around you, 55 degrees of track temperature or whatever it was for Moto2, and the general heat about... It balloons, loses its squishability. I know that isn't a Dunlop term, but I'll use it for that. It just loses that <laughs> that bit of surface area where if it's ballooned, then you've got a tyre that's got less surface area effectively going into a corner because it is it is slightly stiffer. It's slightly holding its shape. 
Um, what you want is the thing to squish into the track and to spread out so you've got that little bit more surface area, both rear and front, but mostly the front obviously is where you're going to lose it mostly. And uh, that makes a massive difference when you're fighting for position. You push your luck. Whereas if you're six or seven seconds out front, nice clean air all around you, no turbulence, and uh, the aero is doing what it should do. Certainly something that all the riders had to monitor, wasn't it? Uh, up and down the class as well. At the end of the Moto2, as you say, uh, Vietti stumbles, no points, but still holds on to the uh, title lead for the moment. 133 points ahead of Ayagura, 125. Augusto Fernandez, 121. Aaron Canet and Tony Arbolino uh, rounding out the top five. So they are closing quite quickly on Celestino Vietti. Uh, Moto3 then uh, is Anguivera. Uh, Pete led from the front and pulled away again uh, to win back-to-back races uh, in Moto3 ahead of uh, Dennis Foggia and Sergio Garcia but uh, a race once again I suppose in Moto3 marred by uh, quite a, a few crashes especially at the start. They were, weren't they? Yeah, none of the Brits uh, finished did they? I mean uh, John McPhee was taken out the first corner. Scott Ogden was on for uh, I think a top 10 wasn't he? He was having a great ride and then a pretty nasty high side so uh, but from Gravara's point of view really a perfect weekend I mean right from from Friday he was just sort of you know he seemed to have something above all of the others and uh, yeah to break away like he did uh, you know he's certainly Garcia still leading the championship but not by much I think it, it could be some uh, some a bit of a tense atmosphere in the Aspar pits for the second half of the season because it's looking like those two guys Fodge's dropped I think it's over 50 points back isn't he so we could have a, a teammate versus teammate battle there and uh, yeah uh, came, came down to the final corner for the for the uh, second place sort of sort of fight Garcia tried to make the move but Fodge got him back so uh, so yeah but 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 Gravara undoubtedly is the is the man of the moment Gravara over the last five races had the advantage there's no doubt about that he's closing him down my concern with the with the smaller classes just slightly diverting away from the, the performances at the weekend is money <laughs> it's because we're getting into the second half of the season right now and what worries me particularly with a new team like Michael Laverty's team for instance you know MLAV's team you know okay they're sponsored Vision Tracker got some money in the in the game um, but it's all about results at the end of the day and when you've got outside sponsors asking when are we going to get our first podium when are we going to get this when are we going to get that you know Money suddenly starts to slow down a bit. You need results in the last half of the season. They've really, I mean, Scott Ogden has been brilliant and the Vision Track team have been brilliant to, to, to get to where they've got to from a cold start at the end of last year. Laverty works, well, I've said it before, I think there's three Michael Laverty's, depending on, hmm. you know, there's clones. They're working in different parts of the world because um, it's the only way you can cover the ground, surely. Um, <laughs> does he ever get home to see his wife and child? <laughs> Probably about one day a month, I should think, at the moment. Um, but the concern is always, and it's something that's so difficult to legislate for, is who is going to be stumping the money up in the next year? You know, how long is this deal going to be? It's all very well having contracts as well, but, you know, people renege on contracts sometimes. And we've heard of it before. You need results um, to get these outside sponsors, to keep these outside sponsors. Josh Watley's been doing a great job, but of course, he's the back end of the field. What's a great job to us and to other riders and to team management isn't necessarily a great job to someone who's put in whatever they're putting in, half a million, a million, whatever it might be. So they need results. It's a results paid business. And uh, I'm always concerned about Moto2 and Moto3. Some teams just can't keep that money rolling in and then it becomes a real issue. So fingers crossed for those, but we want Vision Track, Michael Laverty's team to uh, have a great second half of the year. I don't know how he also does the commentary while watching his own riders and, and, and team as well. It's it's I, I don't know how he that means that there's a third. There must, there must be a third Laverty doing well, that. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I questioned how he even managed to make a baby during the course of all of his work. But then we won't go there, will we? <laughs> <laughs> well done, Michael. I don't know what clone a... it was that was lucky enough. But anyway, but the yeah. point being <laughs> that um, I think Michael is a... a you know, it's a he's a such a hardworking guy, but I just detect sometimes in his commentary and his presentation at the moment, he's on a little bit more. It has a little bit more tension about it. You know, he, he has just that little bit more in his voice where, you know, he, he wants to get on it, um, and that is unbelievably wearing. He's a mega fit lad, and he's we used to call him the boffin when I worked with him because he's very he's one of these guys that that's got it all in his head and to his to his fingertips. I mean. He, but he's a one-man band show. He's, you know, he, he, he's not very good at sort of delegating. 
you know, he's got his fingers on everything. He's across everything that's going on. Well, that takes its toll. You know, it's, you've mentioned commentary. Nobody realizes that commentary is actually quite hard work because by the time you've, you know, got up at five o'clock in the morning and, and finished off a bit of prep and got to the track and done your stuff and you're stuck there all day long and you're out also doing other bits and pieces, that in itself can be quite a tough weekend. By the time you get to Sunday, when like the riders, like the teams, you've got a peak, you've got to be at your best for the races, it's when you're most knackered. You're three or four days in. You know, you're, you're pretty much worn out by it. And God forbid if you've had a beer or two during the course of the week because that just destroys you come Sunday. You're just hanging by the time you get there. So for Michael to be able to do the kind of things that he does across so many different platforms is bloody amazing. He's absolutely bloody amazing. I, I don't know how he does it, to be frank with you. I really genuinely don't. Well done, Michael. I think that's all, uh, all we can say on that one. We envy you, I think. Uh, but uh, a beer during a, wait, a race weekend, Keith. How unprofessional. I would never, never seen it. Dear Lord. Well, you're uh, a car bloke. But... You're just not used to it, you see. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> well, mate, but we'll have to spend a race weekend together at some point. Um, Moto, what were we talking about? Moto3. That's what we were talking about, weren't we? It was Sergio Garcia, who does still lead, but it is, uh, he is being closed on 166, 166 points at the top. Isan Guevara, uh, 159 points. Now, Dennis Foggia, Jama Masia, and Dennis Onju uh, rounds out the top five in Moto3. Um, not long to wait at all uh, for the next uh, race weekend, Keith. As you already mentioned, uh, we have the Dutch TT at uh, Assen. Uh, back on the calendar for this weekend coming up and you've already spoken about uh, the boat cycling up there tell us more about it what are you hoping for what are you expecting well Assen is a uh, it's two-thirds as good as it used to be um, because uh, we've got that we haven't got the straight we, we used to have and we've got this sort of Mickey Mouse you know turn one two three um, which is a bit of a shame really so Assen isn't quite the track that it used to be but it's still, it might be two thirds the track it was, but it's still 100% better than most other places, with the exception maybe of Phillip Island. Um, it's a great, and, and Magello, and um, 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 um. <laughs> so many great races. <laughs> but from, a, from an atmosphere point of view, to start with, the Dutch are great people. So you're guaranteed an atmosphere with the Dutch. You know, they, they do like to drink, they do like to enjoy their, their, their um, race meetings, there's no doubt about it. There's a huge history of, of racing in Holland, particularly at the TT, obviously. Um, and it just has this great... I mean, I, I always remember a comment that my old mate Julian Ryder, actually he rang me just a minute before we came on air with this, just a moment ago. Um, but I won't go there for the minute. <laughs> but he used to, when he was commentator, I remember they were, they were sweeping these um, at the back of the grandstands. And, he, and I always remember the comment, he said, it's a positive tsunami of beer cans, you know, like only <laughs> Julian could put it in such a, a, an eloquent way. And it is literally, it is just one massive festival. Think Glastonbury and you've got Assen, wow. you know, and, and similarly, it could be just as wet and horrible or it can be absolutely cooking the top of your bonds off one or the other. It, it really is one of them ones. And, and again, you know, Jack Miller, we talked about Jack Miller. Jack Miller's just come off that great ride. Pete talked about it. He had the long lap penalty that he had because, unfortunately, he fell under a yellow flag. That's a real no-no in our game nowadays when you've got marshals exposed on, on the track. You just don't go fast enough to fall off. Otherwise, you deserve a penalty. So that was deserved, even though he was arguing otherwise. Even Jack's personality, he couldn't get him away with that. But then you've got, you know, his ride there, if you remember back in the wet, he's got great memory of Assen. And some riders do. They have this great memory about what they've achieved there in the past. And it's one of those racetracks. It's got that flow to it. It's got that feel to it. And that final set of corners, you know, when you come through that massively fast left-hander to set up breaking into the chicane. And now you've got them parking wardens and bloody people that you can't touch the green paint nor the rest of it anymore you know long gone are the valentino rossi's oh i've hit the dirt i'll gas it straight through <laughs> all that's gone now of course and if you if you if you make a mistake at the chicane nowadays they take away the lap you're just about to start on because you you're starting the lap too fast down the straight as well as finishing it too fast so you effectively would lose two two laps nowadays if you if you're going across the green paint too quick Who'd be Freddie Spencer, right? Me. <laughs> All them world titles. <laughs> but it's, uh, I think Assen, 
you've got lots of vantage points. You've got lots of fun. There's plenty of places that you can stay at around Assen or a little bit further up in Groningen or wherever it might be. You know, the Dutch, as I say, are a great populace anyway. They, you know, they, they definitely know how to enjoy themselves. And they're, they're, they're free-spirited. So, they, they, you know, there's no, there's no bias or aggravation there. You know, sometimes you feel when you're in Austria, for instance, you know, if you don't speak German, then they, they can give you a bit of grief sometimes. If you walk into your local corner shop, they might uh, expect you to speak in German. Um, but the Dutch, nah, none of that at all. They, they embrace the fans over there. And that really comes off as an atmosphere. It's brilliant. You've sold it for me. Um, didn't you've, You have sold many for me, actually, but there are a few where you really do go in and <laughs> not well, touching that one at all. <laughs> I, think that, um, I think that what we'll have to do is persuade um, our benefactor, Will, to um, send us out uh, as a crash team to a few more Grand Prix. And, uh, and we'll, we'll do them from on site. And then I'll be able to take you to the hostelries <laughs> and um, we'll have the scooter races through the uh, Dutch towns and, um, and we'll come back. Oh, with all, we'll come absolutely. Back with all, we'll have the scabs on our arms and um, slightly. Yes. Less, and we'll, we'll have run out of money and we'll have got ourselves yeah. parking fines, speeding <laughs> fines and all the other things that you definitely get in Holland because <laughs> they're quite good at that. <laughs> Uh, and we'll have all of that okay, and we'll be able to report on it and we can get Will to pay for it maybe that was a joke Will if you're listening yeah. our ever so lovely boss Will um, stay tuned on that one listeners we'll keep you updated on that and viewers um, last year Pete uh, at, in Assen the top five Quattararo, Vinales, Mir Zarco Oliveira yeah, quite a mix, wasn't it? You know, bikes and, you know, big variety. Uh, as, as touched on earlier, it, it, was a, it was a track that really, when Gigi spoke at the end of the year, and, and Ducati had a fantastic final race, isn't they? And people were saying, well, what do you want to work on for, for 22? He really only highlighted Assen as being somewhere where they felt they could make an improvement. A lot of fast corners. It, it's a track where very flowing is why, you know, it's made for bike racing, as he was explaining it more so in the past perhaps than now, but it's still got that classic sort of layout and the flip-flops and the fast corners. And it was one area where they felt they could make a bit of progress. It'd be interesting to see if this, this uh, the new fairings and things like that have helped. It seems like they, they that was the area they were trying to target. So it could be quite, a, quite an interesting one this weekend from that point of view as to whether Ducati can really solve their, their one remaining weakness. I mean, who would have imagined Ducati would have been so strong at the Saxon ring, all of those corners, just going back even a handful of years. I mean, they've made fantastic progress. Unfortunately, as we said, it's not really worked out for the Riders' Championship. But going back to last year's race, yeah, it was a Yamaha versus Yamaha, wasn't it? It was It was really Vinales' sort of uh, last hurrah on the Yamaha. And then, uh, you know, we went into, into the summer break, didn't we? And the confirmation that he would join Aprilia, ne- we thought next year, being this year and it turned out that he would only do what was it one more race i think in, in austria for, for yamaha and that was it so yeah it was his, his last sort of really strong performance on the yamaha and he's arriving fresh from as you, as you said earlier a great ride on the aprilia so he's definitely going to be in i think i'm going to pick him as one of my top three for this weekend i'm going to take a oh he's got uh, yeah, in I'm there gonna take a take a punt on that on maverick to uh to be one of the guys, so there we go. But and you can be sure at Aston as well. Keith has said it. That final chicane, always action, always, uh, always drama, mm. and uh, you know it just it just makes for good racing. You always get close racing. We we're speaking about the, the dr- really drawn out winners that we saw at Saxon Ring. You can expect the opposite at Aston. You normally get fights going right down to the to the final chicane. So uh, yeah, it should be a great event, and you never know what the weather's going to do. That's the other thing. So you, you no, know, very it, it good could point. Be, yeah, it can literally change. You know, within a few minutes, you can get drops of rain. So, and Keith's... Uh, what? Is that the weather? I was, just, I was just looking the weather up yeah. for later on. And, uh, what is it? What are we talking? <laughs> We're talking um, thunderstorms Friday, <laughs> <laughs> cloud and rain on Saturday, <laughs> and the same on Sunday. Wow. And Ooh. even more on Monday when you're coming home on your bike. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> the, so flag the weather flag forecast. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, all of a sudden... Yeah, this is the thing with predictions, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what do you go for? What do you go for? I mean, it's it's you know you're going to have Miller in the equation if it's going to be sort of wet. You know, it's uh, I don't know. I mean, I always I try to base things on a dry dry race mostly because you do, don't you? I can't wait for our predictions. That's going to be real fun. Well, yeah, you get get quick think now because they're coming at you thick and fast. Um, because after last weekend, um. It's Pete 
in last place now. He didn't get anything. Actually, no, you were you got you got a Quattararo. Oh, you got, got one point. So in our little table, Keith's got eight points. I move up to second with Quattararo and Zarco as Good my call. predictions. And oh, if Alaysia just hung in there, it would have been a clean sweep. <laughs> uh, if only. Keith, I'm afraid you had nothing. Nada. You you were Alaysh, Bastianini, and Binder. Nil poir. Uh, but you're still at the top with 10, but you're not far off. I tell you what, it's a drastic improvement from me from last year. Um, and because you're leading, Keith, um, Pete can start <laughs> with his predictions. <laughs> right, why not? Well, yeah, well, I've already I've already said finales and like why, so I'll go with him. I'll go I'm gonna go a lace second. I'm gonna go a double Aprilia podium. I think I'm Wait, vi- what? Vinales for the oh, sorry, win? Sorry, no, Vinales third, a lace second. I was going oh, right. a second. And uh, I, I'm afraid. Quattararo, I think, is uh, again. It's going to depend on the weather, but I, I just think the form he's on. He won last year. It's hard. It's hard to spot any weaknesses in in the way Fabio's riding at the moment. So yeah, Fabio first, Aleish and and Maverick. I'll, I'll go for. Okay, nicely done. Um, I, I'm going to go next, uh, Keith. Uh, we're going to do it in, in ascending order of our standings. I'm going to go for Quattararo for the win as well. I'm going to stick with my... It's been going well for me so far. I'm going to go Zarco second. And I'm going to go... I don't know. I'm going to go Espargro for third. Although I do think Vinales will be up there. But that's going to be my top three. Tricky, isn't it? Because I've got mm-hmm. Zarco in the mix. And Rain or Shine, he's a good bet. Mm. So I think Zarco is a good bet either way when it comes to Assen. quattararo has got to be in there. So there's two of mine, Zarco and Quattararo. And I've got Bangnaya. I have Bangnaya in there. But if that weather is going to be what it is, I'm going to think I'm going to switch him out for Miller. Ooh. So I'm, I'm going to have a Quattararo, Zarco, Miller. Okay. He had a good ride at, 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 at Saxon Ring. Mm. And uh, he's got good memories of, of, of the light. I know that um, last year didn't turn out quite the way it should have done for him but at Assen. But, um, I mean, it's, it's testament, isn't it, to, to our sport that you really can't you can't pick if if you if you've managed to get the 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 three you've been more lucky than skillful when yeah. it comes to actually picking them out i mean i know everyone at home must be having a bit of fun with this as well and please do take the mickey out of your so-called three experts because we are obviously not <laughs> <laughs> um and and you at home have every bit as uh, much skill in uh, in picking the th- the top three as anybody else because it is literally a lottery based on how the track is going to be and 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 who's performing at the time. No, certainly we we do go through. Uh, well, I certainly do the U- the YouTube comments, seeing uh, your predictions as well. So keep them coming in as well. We like to see your top three. There's usually a lot of overlap. Sometimes people come out of nowhere with left field, but then again, as you say, it's MotoGP. You can do that, and you might still get one podium prediction right well, although i have brilliant. to say i have to say that i did go a bit wild last weekend <laughs> you i mean <laughs> <laughs> I, ask anybody i do quite like a sporting <laughs> bet but i think i might have just been a bit too that sporty. was a bit too far yeah <laughs> brad, brad binder was a bit left of field that's for sure on, yeah. given on that. Uh, i think i think i was being greedy and thinking that i might actually know something <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> clearly not. <laughs> Who knows? Well, they are locked in now, our predictions. As I said, let us know yours as well. Um, and that brings us to the end, gents, of another podcast. Thank you very much as ever. Thank you to you for listening and tuning in at home or wherever you may be. Asin is just a few days away now. So make sure you're tuned in across Crash.net for all the latest news and analysis across the week. And then we'll be back with you uh, as ever the following week. Get your questions in, leave them in the comment section tweet instagram or facebook us just search crash moto gp please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts as uh, well and we'll see you right back here next week bye-bye